Coming up on Tech News Today, Trey Ratcliffe joins us to tell you who needs 36 megapixels in the Nikon D800. Also, Google Chrome, now on Android. Wasn't there already? No, apparently not. And Apple's iTV might arrive through ISPs like a phone. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, February 7th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle. The easy way to sell or recycle your used electronic gadgets from your home or office. Gazelle your used gadgets today at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And joining us today, Derek Colanduno, co-host of the Skepticality Podcast, the official podcast of Skeptic Magazine. How's it going, Derek? I'm pretty good. How are you Uh-oh. guys doing? I, uh, <laughs> His video is gone. He looks on the video a little like wallpaper, <laughs> but I, I that usually like... wears off after a while. Uh, is I'll... that my end? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you stopped sending video. Uh, stop and restart. That'll fix it. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you back. Skeptical Skype connection. We're going to start off, though, talking to uh, Mr. Trey Ratcliffe, travel photographer from StuckInCustoms.com. You know him. You love him. He, re- he does great photos on Google+. Plus. Uh, well, he does great photos, but you can see him on Google+. Plus. Uh, Trey, great to have you back on the show. Hey, thanks, Tom. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. We're doing well. I uh, wanted to have you on to talk about the Nikon D800 uh, that was announced today. It's a DSLR available in March for $2,999.95. The big headline on it, 36 megapixel FX format sensor. We'll talk about what that actually means for a photographer. Uh, And it's uh, really emphasizing video can output uncompressed HDMI, among other things. I guess my question for you, Trey, right off the bat is... Uh, you know, you say three thousand dollar camera from Nikon. Okay, so this is a fancy camera. It's it's full frame, uh, and I know that that already puts it in the same camp with, let's say, Canon's five D Mark II, which got a lot of attention when it was announced. Not only because it was a beautiful camera, but it allowed people to take beautiful video. How does the D eight hundred compare to the Mark II? Well, the D eight hundred is a great camera on its own. And it's something that a lot of Nikon people are excited about. But if you're comparing it video-wise to the to the 5D Mark II, it's really just kind of caught up to where Canon has been for years. It has a few other little advantages, which will soon come out for the next iteration of Nikon. These guys keep leapfrogging each other. But it has this uncompressed HDMI output, and that's really nice. Uh, but frankly, I think, you know... They do something strange with their marketing. They make it seem like 50% of the market is out there doing film and making video and videographers. But I think this is actually a very small percentage of the market. And anyone that does serious videography with DSLRs, they jumped to Nikon a long time ago. So I think this is a really nice improvement for Nikon, but I don't know if it's going to woo anybody away from the the Canon side that made the jump uh, a year or so ago. And how about the how about the uh, the souped up version of the D eight hundred, which goes for I think it's about thirty two hundred dollars. Which I think I read the only real difference is that it allows for anti aliasing and it's good for let's say it, uh, somebody who's working on a lot of print or fashion photography. Yeah, so this this 800E is perhaps the most confusing upgrade <laughs> option of any camera bifurcation in the history of, of camera marketing. And if you look at the tech specs, right, of why you might want to pay $300 for this E version, if you understand the tech specs, then you may want to do it. For To put it in layman's terms, basically what's happening is they're charging you $300 more dollars to take off a filter because what happens is, uh, you know, and by the way, I get a lot of my information from my good friend, uh, Gordon Lang at cameralabs.com. I'm, I'm really, let's keep this in mind. I'm really sort of an artistic guy. I, I, I bend the camera and the software to my, to my will. I know, I know enough about the technology to kind of explain it in, in common terms. So here's, here's the thing with that upgrade. All right. Cameras have 
uh, this anti-aliasing problem because the way the sensor is built is it's a row, it's horizontal and vertical rows. So whenever you take pictures of something that is horizontally aligned or vertically aligned, let's say like a, a roof or a columns or or anything like this, you get this thing called a moiré pattern, right? You might see this if you look quickly at a screen door, you see intercrossing uh, parallel mm-hmm. lines, and you get some strange activity happening. Well, in order to get rid of that, what these cameras do is they put something called a low-pass filter on that takes these rough, jagged edges, right, this anti-aliasing, this sort of 8-bit video game jaggy that you've seen before, and what the filter does is it blurs it so the jaggy doesn't look so bad. And this 800E version, what they do is they remove that filter so that you can actually see the jaggies once again and fix whatever you might want to fix in post-processing. So it's just a little bit more of that prosumer uh, model. You should uh, pay less. They're taking more. it out. Yeah, really. I guess <laughs> I guess I hear all of the... Uh, you say, okay, this is a great camera, but it's kind of just Nikon catching up to Canon. Are we ever going to get past the point where people are either Nikon people and they're really excited about this or they're Canon people and they say things like, well, great camera, but Nikon's like two years behind Canon. Does it, I mean, how much does that matter? I guess it just depends on what kind of lens kits you have and what body you would need more. Well, you know, when I when I talk about catching up with Canon, that's really only in terms of the video side. Uh, on the photography side, this does do many nice things, right? It's it's a 36 megapixel for people that are megapixel hunters. That that's a big deal. I think a lot you would find probably most hardcore photographers they would much rather see Nikon go down the low light sensitivity route than the megapixel route. And they've done a little bit there, but maybe they could have done done more. In the grand scale of things, just looking at things in a sort of a, a meta layer, this is about uh, the kind of state of the art that we can get to in DSLRs. If you're really looking for something disruptive, uh, the, the Sony line of cameras, all right, they can do this very high definition video, 1080p. They can even go up to 60 frames per second. You start to run into real limitations with DSLRs because they still follow. Uh, they do follow focus using contrast based, uh, as opposed to a lot of the things the Sony can do, which DSLRs can't. Um, so this is a, a very um, crazy time. And when it comes to high level uh, uh, DSLRs versus these new mirrorless systems, and they will kind of keep leapfrogging each other. And this idea that you brought up, this you invest in a lot of lenses and you just swap out the camera body over time. This is something that all photographers have gotten used to. But I think this may go away as people adopt entirely new systems in the next few years. Trey, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to talk with us. One of the reasons we love having you on is because you can explain what is very complex machinery uh, in a way that makes sense to folks. So we really appreciate that. Uh, of course, they can find you on stuckincustoms.com, follow you on Google+. Plus. Any Anything else where people should look for your work? No, uh, you know, just <laughs> internet me or something. Just I'm in, out there. He's on the internet. Just look. Yeah. Fire up a browser. You'll find him. <laughs> Thanks, Trey. Really appreciate you taking the time. Sure. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye, Trey. Moving on, Google finally bringing Chrome to Android. What? It wasn't there? Yeah, a lot of people who don't use Android may not realize this, but uh, the Android browser is not Chrome officially. They didn't go the route of just branding it Chrome, even though it's not Chrome. And the beta of the actual Chrome browser in Android is now available if you're using an ice cream sandwich, Android 4. It does not replace the Android browser. That standard browser is still there. You can make the Chrome browser become your default for links, Uh, but it doesn't actually make itself available to other apps in all the ways that the standard browser would. Chrome leader Sundar Pichai confirmed that Chrome will take over as the default browser on Android eventually, but right now it's in beta. A couple of nifty things. It uh, it looks like the desktop version of Chrome. Uh, It remembers what you were last looking at on your desktop Chrome browser and syncs it across to your mobile device, which is something I wish two desktops would do. From mm-hmm. Chrome to Chrome, but that that's cool. Uh, Jason, you've, you've been playing around with it this morning. What do you think? Yeah, I've only really had it for a couple of hours when I first saw the news break. I, it was like the first thing uh, first thing I did was hop right on the market and download it. Say, so I'm lucky enough to have an ice cream sandwich phone. Um, it's it's great. I mean, it's it's definitely like after 10 minutes of using the Chrome browser on the phone, I immediately like removed the shortcut to the old browser and replaced it with Chrome. Uh, it has some really cool features. Like you said, the Chrome Sync. Um, 
between your desktop and your phone is just ridiculously awesome and works really well. It also has just your typical Chrome sync for bookmarks, passwords, all that kind of stuff built into the browser itself instead of the thing that we had to do before was Chrome to phone, a separate app, and you had to make sure that you were logged into it and everything. Now it's just built into the browser the way it should be. It does things like preload web pages so that you have a little bit faster browsing uh, if it can detect where it thinks you're going to next. And some really cool ways of, of switching tabs that actually in some ways mimic are very similar to kind of the WebOS tiles kind of swiping away method. Um, just overall, super awesome improvements. And uh, it's it's just really too bad that only the small percentage of ice cream sandwich users are going to get this. Having said that, it's also kind of a controlled beta in that regard. You know, they have a much smaller user base to kind of test this out with. Who knows if they're going to go backwards and, you know, in versions and release it to earlier versions. It just sucks for anyone who's stuck on gingerbread or earlier. Developers are very excited about it. It supports uh, WebSockets, IndexedDB, WebWorkers, hardware accelerated rendering for HTML5, Canvas Element, uh, a built-in remote debugging tool that works over USB. Uh, you're a programmer, Derek. Does, do, I, I know you're not necessarily an Android guy, but does any, does any of this sound exciting to you? Well, it's really funny to me is until the, the today... I have, I mean, I use some Android devices at my office because people at my office have them. I mainly have um, iOS stuff, but I didn't realize it wasn't actually Chrome, Chrome in the back end. I didn't, I noticed that they had a different net label, but I assumed it was Chrome in the back end considering, you know, it's Android and Google. So I just assumed that, but obviously I was wrong. Is there a reason why they didn't? come out with the Chrome browser at the beginning? Is there a reason why they're they're holding it back or anything like that? I think it's Does more just that the two teams weren't working closely enough together um, in the earlier days of Android. I just, yeah, I don't think that they found an easy way to do all of the things they wanted to do on Chrome on the Android browser. And they could have just labeled. I mean, the Safari browser on iOS is not the same as the Safari browser on your desktop, but they still call it Safari, right? Well, it might have been a smarter move to keep them separate considering all the features that Google has added to the desktop version of Chrome with their web app store and just extensions and things like that. You can't really do that with the regular browser. And that browser was probably baked in from the original Android team that Google bought. So why bother to combine them right now? I've been thinking of, like, this This reminds me of this prediction I had that this will be their web top interface, merging Chrome OS a bit with Android that when you dock your phone eventually, you can have a full-on experience because there's a lot of things that Chrome can do that actually kind of replicate what Android does already. Like you can have like something like a TweetDeck or an HTML5 app running in Chrome, and that would be synced everywhere all the time. So now your phone gets even less tied necessarily to your Google ID and then downloading everything. Everything is already up in the cloud for you. So it could provide a really interesting experience from device to device, especially since Google wants you to be able to go from a Chromebook to a phone to a tablet to whatever. You have a really consistent kind of feel. And remember, yeah, I was uh, actually, yeah, go ahead, Derek. The, that was actually what I was thinking of right before you said it was, does this mean that they're getting more to where um, Apple kind of is with the iOS, where you can actually create web apps that look like a native app on the uh, on the phone? So you could do that as well, like you yeah. said. Uh, Adobe, now, you know, they're not developing Flash for mobile anymore. There is no yeah. Flash for this Chrome browser. But Adobe did say they are working with Google to develop HTML5 apps for their browsers, including Chrome. So that is definitely a place they could go. On to a story of intrigue, deception, and just moral turpitude. Uh, an email exchange was posted to Pastebin last night showing a conversation between a Symantec employee named Sam Thomas and a hacker going by the handle Yama Tough. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce that, Y-A-M-A-T-O-U-G-H. They were negotiating to prevent the release of PC Anywhere and Norton Antivirus source code. At one point, $50,000 was discussed as the amount that would be paid. Uh, they wanted assurances that the code wasn't going to be released. They offered to pay $25 a month for the first three months. Symantec, $2,500 a month. $2,500, thank you. Symantec says that law enforcement was conducting the conversation as a sting to try to find out who the hackers were. Uh, and after several weeks, the talks broke down. Yamatuff, who is a part of the Lords of Dharma Raja group, told Reuters' Frank Jack Daniel, they never wanted the money. They wanted to embarrass Symantec. They think the story that this is a sting is laughable. 
uh, and announced that the Norton antivirus code would be released today. And in fact, it was released to P2P networks. It's available on Pirate Bay right now, PC Anywhere code. Haven't seen the Norton antivirus code yet. That might be out there as well. Just haven't seen it. Um, but they've taken to the Twitters on both anonymous IRC and on uh, uh, the Pirate Bay's uh, Twitter. They've announced with a link where you can get the PC Anywhere source code. So whatever was going on, it broke down. It didn't work. They didn't catch the hackers, and the source code is now out in the wild. Well, this this uh, semantic employee, Sam Thomas, semantic has said, yeah, the person doesn't exist. This is just the way that we were working. Or uh, does he? Or, or does he? Um, it's apparently a fictitious name. What's interesting about this story is, I mean, a lot of the correspondence is all out in the open. And Semantic is saying, yeah, I mean, we were we, we were engaging in this. We were working with an organization. We don't want to say who we were working with, but it was to draw out information from whoever was on the other side. And you read these emails back and forth, and it's pretty much just Semantic finding any way to delay this. Ooh, uh, we can't uh, figure out uh, a secure FTP solution. Give us a, uh, now, give us a few days. On the other side, Yamatov saying the same thing. Like, we, we, it wasn't a sting. That was a real person. And we were just trying to draw out the negotiation so we could have this conversation posted up in and embarrass them. And you see them saying things like, oh, we can't accept $50,000 because our offshore client won't accept anything, anything below $50,000. 50, so $50, they're, they're both playing a cat and mouse game here. Derek, you were going to say something. What, right. what's, what's on your mind? Well, I was, I was just saying, is, is, that, is that all the whole antivirus is worth? $50,000? It seems low to me. Yeah, they're, they're low balling. The, yeah. uh, the hackers. You know what? I, I think Symantec realizes that it's embarrassing to have the source code out there. It's not ideal. Uh, it does raise security threats, but they probably have had enough time since this was stolen to figure out how to batten down the hatches. Uh, they've got, they, they say that Norton Antivirus is not in any danger. PC Anywhere, right now, they're recommending that you don't use it. That's pretty bad. Although they say they've got a fix for that coming out now, too. Remember, open source. Code is out all the time on purpose with open source projects as a way to increase security. The reason that doesn't work here is that you don't have a community of people pounding away on your source code to try to find security vulnerabilities. That's not the way these security companies work. So there could be vulnerabilities discovered in the source code that maybe Symantec knows about, maybe they don't, uh, that could prove to be a higher risk in the short run. I mean, it could be a good time mind. for a PC and I mean, Symantec to actually just forced to be open source, just go out and say, look, it's out there, it's ready, you guys can fix it. But I think Symantec did issue some patches last week for PC Anywhere up to 12.5, offering free upgrades. So I'm not sure if, there's, if they still recommend not using it right now. I read it today. Oh, so they've gone back on that. That's well, they didn't go of, back. They just said that they had, if you were running the old version of PC Anywhere, they recommend not. Yeah, they've been, they've been offering free upgrades to 12.5, which is supposed to be more secure. Um, I, I'm, this is a really interesting experiment. What are you What are you going to do now? I mean, are you going to go open source because it's out there, or just no? They're not going to go open source. They're, they're just going to change. They're going to change the product. Change the name. See, I, say to me, I this is the best idea. If if they want to actually get ahead of these people, they just just over open source it, and I think people would rally around it and fix it. I agree, but I don't see them doing oh, no. that. <laughs> I, I, I yeah, I, I think they that they should probably consider that. And should have considered it a long time ago, but yeah, that's that's not the way security companies work, and they have good arguments for why they don't. I I don't necessarily well, fall on that side of the arguments, but it's they're not being irrational. It's only worth fifty thousand dollars. Who cares? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I you know let's pool let's start a Kickstarter operation. Uh, yeah. uh, all right, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor Gazelle.com. Look, I'm going to make it quick. I'm going to make it simple. You want to make some cash to buy new gadgets or cash to do anything with, and you got old gadgets right lying around you don't use, and you know you do. You've got some gadget lying around that you're like, you know, why do I even have that? I don't use it anymore. Go to gazelle.com, look it up, find out how much money they'll give to you. It's the easiest way to get rid of gadgets. You don't have to deal with people, with negotiations, with waiting. You just go on to gazelle.com, you type in the name of the product that you've got, you tell them what condition it is in, you know, whether you have the cables, all of that stuff. They give you an estimate. And they let you print out a label right there. I did it with my uh, with my iP uh, iPad, my old version one, 64 gigabyte iPad, uh, and I dropped it off this morning. 
So I can actually track. I can find out where it is. I can go to gazelle.com. I can look. It'll tell me, okay, we're, we, we've we sent you the shipping kit. You can, we can resend it to you. It'll make it super easy for you. And then they give me the FedEx tracking number. So even I dropped it off today, and there was a big line. I'm like, hey, can I just leave this here? I was a little nervous. I was like, I want to make sure that they actually you know got it and scanned it. I can go to gazelle.com. I can look at the FedEx site, and there it is. I'm able to say, oh, it's in FedEx's possession. They've got it. And then I can track it all the way to Gazelle, find out when Gazelle gets it. Then Gazelle will let me know, okay, we've looked at it. We've verified the condition. We're sending you your $200. You can get paid by PayPal. You can get paid by check. You can get paid by Amazon and Walmart gift certificates. You can even donate to charity. Plus, they recycle ink cartridges. Got a bunch of ink cartridges. Don't throw them in the trash. That's irresponsible. Throw them in the box with your Gazelle item that you're making money on. They'll recycle those for you, too. Just to help. Thanks to gazelle.com for their sponsorship of Tech News Today. And don't forget when you check out when they say, hey, how'd you hear about this? Choose podcast, choose Tech News Today. Let them know that you heard about it right here on the podcast. And we thank them for their support. Don't just sell it. Gazelle it. Gazelle.com. So Wolfram Alpha is now got a pro tier. A pro tier is going to be launched tomorrow. It's some pretty cool stuff. Dieter Bone over at The Verge has a great write-up and a video showing the features of this. And they actually talked to Stephen Wolfram. So they're not, they're not just finding this information from just anywhere. It's from the source. For 5 bucks a month or $3 for students, pro users get an account with the complete history of their queries, uploads, and downloads. Pro users get the ability to generate Wolfram Alpha reports using image files, spreadsheets, 3D geometry, audio files. So instead of just doing a text search for certain items, you can actually generate reports based on images if you want. In, the, in an example in the video, uh, the Verge showed off uh, an image being analyzed, and you've got a whole bunch of information on it, like the XF data, the colors in HTML identifiers, edge detection, optical, ca optical character recognition. Plus, these reports are interactive. So if you wanted to mess around and see the different images, you can have like a slider. You could change things to see how it looks. The charts within the reports are exportable, but not all of them because there's some kind of licensing, some proprietary technology in there. And it's going to be available for a trial period so you can test it out. This is great for academics if you're wondering, why would I ever use this? Uh, if you're a scientist, if you're a mathematician, you're a researcher of any kind, uh, this is the kind of thing that's going to get you excited. And it's pretty cheap for being able to process your own structured data with Wolfram Alpha's uh, service. Two ninety nine for students a month? That's nothing for this quality uh, of research software. I, I, I think if, if you're in academia at all, you're going to be really excited. If you're just a consumer, this probably isn't going to float your boat. But hey, Wolfram Alpha is powering a, a quarter of your Siri responses, right? We could easily that, That's true. But we could easily be doing this with our, our market data, with iPhones and iOS stuff going on every now and then, seeing the kinds of different, um, like, like a heat map of iOS devices in one area or not. Yeah. And then one of the coolest things about this pro account is Wolfram Alpha is being selective in what they're giving you. They're not just giving you like, here's a bar graph for the sake of a bar graph. They're going to show you different kinds of graphs that are actually applicable to the data you put in it. One of the things they showed in there, I think, was GDP versus homicides. And they showed like a heat map on, on like I think it was Africa, and then they showed another one of GDP versus homicides. It was just this really intriguing way to learn new information. I think in the article I read, it was something interesting that Stephen Wolfram had said. It's just, people aren't just looking for the answer. It's like, what is the answer to X? Oh, it's 42. It's like, that's not really good enough anymore because there's so much context and how, how do numbers arrive at a certain place and what does it look like in a graph chart type of thing. So Wolfram well, Alpha is, is great for that sort of thing. I mean, it's a completely different search. So yeah, if you want to have more robust uh, um, stats and answers, this seems like a, a real slam dunk, especially for students um, in these lines. Field. For me, this is actually where I was finally see where you can actually use Wolfram Alpha. When it first came out, I was like, this is kind of cool, but there's like a missing piece. And I think this part is like getting much closer to what they actually wanted to do. It's much more like the desktop system that it came from. Yeah, yeah, very much so. All right, let's move on to uh, some rumors. We probably should have rumor milled this one, but uh, Rogers and BCE, those are two Canadian uh, internet companies have the Apple ITV in their labs. That's the, the mythical unicorn-like Apple television. Uh, and according to the Globe and Mail, which is Canada's most popular newspaper, well, by circulation anyway, uh, Apple is negotiating a partnership with Rogers and BCE uh, for the Apple TV. So it sounds like, if the Globe and Mail is correct, this would work the way you buy a phone. You would, you would get it through an ISP, 
rather than a cable company, although Rogers is also a cable company. So there's there's some mixing there. And uh, Globe and Mail reports that you control it with voice and gestures, as we have heard rumored before, without hardware. There's an on-screen keyboard you can call up with a gesture and then type on without ever picking up a remote. What if you want you to? Don't. Pick- you don't. But what know- if... All right. I guess they know Apple more of what I want than, you, than I do. You will not want a remote. Okay. I guess I don't the need a remote anymore. Steve told you you don't want to use a hardware in a vice. You have to, like, touch things through the air. That's right. All kidding aside, this sounds really awesome. Yeah, round the horn. Let's uh, The idea of buying a television that gets you all the programs you want through some kind of iTunes service through the ISP. Maybe there's some kind of data plan. Let's set aside the net neutrality debate about whether or not that would be an issue. Would, would you do it? Would you buy a service plan for a television? Yes. Yeah? Because I'm, I'm buying so many um, a la carte shows via iTunes anyway. So any way that that process could be streamlined for me is good. Now, that's not, it, it, that's not to say that this would be the only solution that I would have uh, because right now, anything in iTunes is limited as to what the catalog has. So the catalog is still really important. But yeah, I, is, uh, the more streamlined, the better. Derek, what about you? Well, here's my first question, when, uh, according to what Sarah was saying. We don't even know if this is going to be just boxed into iTunes alone. Maybe it also has some interface like TiVo or you know, Replay TV used to have, where you could actually subscribe to a normal system and Apple somehow has some magic behind it. So it actually works like a TiVo-type interface where you don't need to buy everything through iTunes and it gets Apple into this system where you don't, they don't have to get deals with all the people who don't want to deal with them. Although Maybe the, there's something like that. The Global Mail story does indicate that it's not going to mess with DVRs, but you're right. That uh, it doesn't mean that it, that this is all rumor anyway. So it could go that. Yeah, direction. I mean, we have no idea. Ayaz, what about you? I avoid Apple first generation products and this this thing. There's no way this thing is fully <laughs> but baked. What about, the, what about the concept? Once well, the it concept got baked, is yeah. yeah, the concept's yeah. really interesting to me. But like the way the, the first iPhone was and the first iPad, I like the second gen version better. So I'm just gonna. I'd like this to be real, but I'm going to wait for the second one. Jason, you yeah. second unicorn. I'm I'm interested. I want to I want to find out more of the the yeah. nitty gritty details, but absolutely the concept as a whole uh, interests me for sure. All right, let's finish up with Facebook's active users. How many are there really, Sarah? Well, it depends on who you ask. Uh, Facebook, um, in their prospectus um, that goes along with them filing for IPO, um, they've got numbers. Uh, they say monthly active users eight hundred forty five million, and daily active users four hundred eighty three million. So. Um, about half of the monthly active users are coming every day. Now, it's important to remember that that doesn't mean that 845 million people are visiting Facebook.com every month. Anybody who is liking something on a Sports Illustrated blog post that has a Facebook like button, that's an active user. If you're sending your tweets to Facebook, uh, even if you never actually go to your profile page to look at those tweets later on, you're an active user of Facebook. If you comment on a blog using your Facebook ID, if you sign up for a new service that way, you're an active user. So the numbers are not necessarily people who are within the Facebook um, ecosystem. That's, that's, well, they're in the Facebook ecosystem, but they're not actually seeing ads. And that's the, the point of contention that people have sometimes is, well, you might have a million users, but how many of those users are going to be making your company money? And of course, when companies want to go IPO, it, this is a very important questions to ask. Yeah, because I, I, I'm an active user of Facebook because I have all my Twitter posts sure. piped in there, but I never go to Facebook. I mean, hardly. Ever. Yeah. So I, 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 oh, I wasn't sure if I counted or not. Yeah, if you, if many. Oh, there's many, many blogs that use the Facebook blog um, interface for you to comment. So it gets rid of spam. So many blogs, people are actively users of Facebook, but they never go there. Right. And that's, you know, it's Facebook says, well, you know, you can be a uh, Facebook user all sorts of ways. But again, it's it's that whole revenue part of it. Now, The New York Times had an article. They quoted uh, Nielsen, uh, Nielsen Radians, who counted 153 million unique users per month on the Facebook site in the U.S., um, although Facebook says in filing 161 million. So there's a little discrepancy there. Uh, New York Times is figuring, well, if the U.S. market is only about 90% of Facebook's overall business, the numbers are off by about 40 million users. That's important. Again, when you're about to file for an IPO, it's worth mentioning Facebook is in their quiet period, so they're not going to comment on this directly. But their perspective does say... 
Listen, numbers are going to differ. Um, if you're getting a number from a published、uh, third party、uh, due to differences in methodology,、um, and it's also worth mentioning that about half of the million,、uh, 845 million monthly users are mobile users. Now, they're not seeing ads either, not yet, not yet anyway.、Yeah. Um, TechCrunch points out that, okay, New York Times makes a lot of good points, but they're only talking about Nielsen ratings. Comscore, direct competitor to Nielsen,、um, they, their numbers are a little bit different.、Uh, they say、um, those same, amount,、uh, same users going to Facebook.com directly、um, turned into about 162 million uniques back in December. They use similar types of methodologies. You know, as, as, as far as we can see, they're tracking user samples. Roughly the same way. So, if the New York Times had just bought, gone by Comscore's numbers, you could almost say that Facebook was undercounting the site usage. So, this is definitely important、um, when you're talking about numbers like this that they don't always add up, certainly not with third parties.、Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, what, what I think is the most interesting about this is okay, so we're talking about who is an active user. Are you going to Facebook on a daily basis? Are you just participating? Participated in Facebook somehow. It's sort of yes, we're all active users, but how are they going to monetize the people who aren't going to Facebook directly? Now, remember that Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg used to work at Google and she was on the AdSense team. Right. So she's keenly aware that you can make a crap ton of money and nobody ever has to come to Facebook at all. Well, that's why I think this really only matters during the IPO, right?、Mm-hmm. Which is, I want to, as an investor, when I'm deciding how many shares I want to buy on IPO day, I want to know the accurate amount of active users. But really, as long as that bottom line is coming in, Facebook doesn't really care. It, it, that's all just kind of public relations, essentially. Well, sure. And I, I, I think um, um, advertising on、uh, the mobile versions is, I mean, right around the corner. Half of the people, of their huge number of active users, Are accessing Facebook via mobile. I'm one of those people. And I think the big thing that drove their revenue for the past three years was advertising already. So they're making profits already on advertising. So even if these people aren't going to Facebook directly, the, be- the behaviors are still being tracked. You're still seeing what people are doing. And if they do go to Facebook any single time, they're going to get some really, really good targeted ads. I mean, this is kind of a, this weird thing about like, like Spotify. When Spotify switched, if you, had, if you wanted to join Spotify, you needed to have a Facebook account. People are tracking your, your music habits. And so when you go to Facebook and see that ad for your favorite band or a concert ticket, eventually, you might actually pay for it. And they're going to make money on it. Whenever we talk about Facebook's quiet period, I just imagine them in a hoodie, kind of in a corner. See,、coding. while you were putting your、uh, hoodie on, I thought you were going to do like an Emperor Palpatine thing. Yeah, I was, that's, yeah. that's what I, I thought, thought was, was going on. Also known as Zuckerberg, Emperor、oh. Palpatine. <laughs> Same. Becoming more interchangeable every Same day. Same guy. <laughs> Move on to the news views. Blackberry DevCon Europe's going on, right, everybody? Woo! Woo!、Uh, RIMS VP for Developer Relations Alex Saunders told the audience there that the Blackberry App World is doing well with over 6 million daily downloads and says that it generates 40 more revenue. Wait, generates 40 more revenue for developers. 40%. 40% more revenue for developers than Google's <laughs> Android market. RIM also showed off Playbook 2.0 along with Blackberry Bridge 2.0 that lets your Blackberry act as a remote for the Playbook. It'll land later this month. Last bit of RIM news here Halliburton. Confirmed that yes, they will switch 4,500 of their employees from BlackBerry to iPhones over two years. So that's less than the 70,000 that work total at Halliburton, but still bad news for Rim. 9 to 5 Google reports that its sources have seen a prototype of Google's augmented reality glasses. The glasses feature a heads up display and apparently look a bit like Oakley Thump's MP3 player sunglasses, along with a front facing camera. The display only appears on one side, it's not transparent, but the glasses can also handle input data via voice. The specs are、uh, supposedly equivalent to a previous gen Android phone. Google may be looking to offer the glasses in a pilot program similar to the C. CR48 Chromebook. Want to know the first game you can get in the new Windows Store in Windows 8? Well, listen up then. The Verge's sources tell it that the store in the Consumer Preview Edition will include Hydro Thunder, Toy Soldiers, Reckless Racing, Full House Poker, and what store would be complete without Angry Birds?、Uh, exactly. So it's a real app store. Good for them. A solitaire and pinball will be pre installed. In other Windows 8 news, the building Windows 8 blog mentions both a Metro interface and And a desktop interface on the ARM based system. Rumors have been running rampant that the ARM version would drop the desktop, and maybe Microsoft's hinting they'll keep it. Big shakeup at Yahoo. Four board members have left. 
They're just changing everything over there. Uh, they got rid of the big sign. They got rid of the chief Yahoo. Uh, now four board members have left, including Chairman Roy Bostock. Yahoo picked up former CEO of Rovi, Fred Amoroso, and former eBay COO Maynard Webb, a new chairman of Yahoo, has not been announced yet. Apple's having issues with using the iPad name in China again. This time, ProView Technology in Shenzhen filed a temporary restraining order in Shanghai court to stop Apple from using the iPad name in China. Apple had previously sued ProView, saying that Apple owned the iPad name. Apple lost that challenge. Yang Rongsheng, uh, chairman of ProView, says, I understand even lots of Chinese people think our company is playing dirty here or trying to blackmail Apple, but we're doing everything completely under the laws and rules. A thesis by Tristan Schaap is making headlines because in it, Schaap says that when he was an intern at Apple, he was porting Darwin, the, ba- the base of OS X, to ARM chips. People shouted that Apple would introduce ARM notebooks. Of course, people read this and lost their minds And because Shap is now part of the core OS team. OSnews.com dug up, dug into the actual thesis and found Shap wasn't bringing full OS X to ARM. He was working on like its core. So we're talking about putting Darwin on things like Time Capsule. So, By the way, iOS runs on ARM, and supposedly it's a yes, derivative right. of OS X, so there so you go. So there you go. EMI was denied an injunction that would have stopped ReDigi from reselling digital music, a concept that I find really ridiculous. EMI claimed that ReDigi makes unauthorized copies of the music files. ReDigi scans a user's PC for music, grabs the file, and deletes the copy the user is selling. District Court's Judge Richard Sullivan said that the case should go to trial due to the technological and legal questions raised. Developer Arun Thompi found out that I uh, that Path 2 for iOS, which is the newest version of Path, sends a copy of a user's address book to Path servers as a plist. Path CEO Dave Morin posted a comment on Thompi's blog saying that the address book upload is necessary to help the user find a connect to their friends and family. However, Morin also noted that the address book upload will be opt-in sharing, starting with Path 2.0.6 once the app is approved by Apple. Um, also, this opt-in feature is already available in the Android version of Path. Remember Ramona Fricosu, the woman who was ordered to decrypt her laptop? Well, her attorney, Philip Dubois, said that she might have forgotten the password. Dubois told Wired.com, It's not clear to me that she was the one who set up the encryption on this drive. I don't, even, I don't know if she'll be able to decrypt it. So what happens now if she can't comply with the court order? Is she could be facing contempt. But how do you prove I, that she doesn't you know? remember it? Yeah, you remember. I can see it in your eyes. Contempt. <laughs> how many people forget passwords all the time? Yeah. it's totally reasonable that that could be true. Let's move on to the randomizer. The... Oh, randomizer. Go, Derek. Hey, trend. Say, oh yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, do you need that guy from Lie to Me? <laughs> a transparent screen for Android lets you walk and text at the same time because it uses the camera to show you on your screen what you're walking over. Excellent. Is, uh-huh. We'll never have to look at people again. This isn't limited and to people- just texting or anything. This is like even your home yeah. screens, your launchers, your <laughs> your emails. It's always there. So it's got to be killing battery. Yeah. Like, oh, I, absolutely. I, I, we're going to hear about people falling down manholes off the side of cliffs. I have a feeling this no. is going to end badly. No, no, they can see the cliffs. The manhole will be avoided yeah. now without you having think? to look up from your All path right. conversation. So we'll hear we'll stories of people avoiding it. About a year. This is a good thing, especially with those Galaxy <laughs> Notes. They're huge. Yeah. Can't you, see anything. You'll actually be able to see the muggers <laughs> coming up from behind you now. <laughs> mm. We'll see how that goes. You're skeptical, I can tell. <gasps> yes, I am. A real <laughs> skeptic in our midst. <laughs> Finally. Finally got that joke in. <laughs> Let's move on to the couch. <laughs> Nokia has released the Bell software upgrade to its Symbian phones, newer ones, uh, one day ahead of schedule. So if you were expecting it tomorrow, hey, it's already out. Bringing features like additional home screens and better notifications, which sounds a lot like what Android and iOS already does, which is true. So they're keeping up with the Joneses. Verizon is launching uh, the Motorola Droid 4 on this Friday, February 10th, with a two-year contract. LTE support. 8 megapixel camera, even a chiclet keyboard. I know some of you are excited about that. Also this Friday, new or existing Verizon customers that are signing new contracts can double their data plan to 4 gigabytes when they purchase a 4G LTE smartphone and sign up for a $30 data plan with accompanying voice and text. The Raspberry Pi team has announced the first manufacturing run of these $35 Linux machines will be finished 
on February 20th. And you can expect them by the end of the month. Initial production is 10,000 units. Um, after that, a $25 model with half of the memory and no Ethernet is also in the works. And finally, uh, this was supposed to be a like a, a, nerd, a nerd Christmas dream for Star Wars nerds. It didn't happen, but it's happening. The Xbox 360 Connect Star Wars game and bundle will begin shipping April 3rd. Microsoft has confirmed it anyway. It's available for pre-order already, $450. That gives you a white Connect sensor, a C-3PO themed wireless controller, and an R2-D2 Xbox 360. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Alan wrote in. Uh, he says he's a friendly web developer. Thank you, Alan. So as you guys were talking about Facebook's inability to delete photos on Monday, and I wanted to give a little technical insight. I used to work for a startup that competed with Facebook using a very similar technology stack. For reference, that would be PHP, MySQL, and Memcache. One of the first things the database engineers tell you is never delete for a number of reasons. Users will want to undo their actions. There are many caching layers from the database to app servers to the CDN. Deleting a row in a database like MySQL locks the table. That is, nobody else can add or change photos in that table while it's deleting. For Facebook, that would probably affect a few million photos for every delete. Most importantly, other things that depend on that photo to exist will also need to be deleted. Things like comments and tags and photo metadata. It's this cascading delete that really affects performance in a bad, bad way. Of course, if there's a tech company that can figure it out, it would be Facebook, but it's certainly not easy. Thanks, Alan, for explaining why it's not something that you're just like, why don't you just delete everything right at the beginning? Why did you ever keep it in the first place? Derek, you, that was the first thing you thought of when you saw this story, wasn't it? That it, It's not that easy to delete. You probably shouldn't yeah. in a lot of cases. My, my thing is, yeah, that's exactly why they did it. I, I saw that right away. My point, my point is, though, I don't understand why they just can't make it so that when somebody references that link, it doesn't give them the picture if they're not logged in. And if they're not the person who uploaded it to begin with, I think that's the best way to do it. They don't have to delete the thing and screw everything up in the database. They could just make it so you can't see it. I think that's, that's there, you know, there may be other reasons why that wouldn't work that we don't know, but that sounds perfectly reasonable to me. Yeah. Just, just so remove the, that flag without deleting the whole record. Uh, but even then, three years, yeah. they should have figured out how to delete things after three years. Three years is a really long time. I've, I don't know. I think so. All right. They, they uh, didn't have the heat of the people. Yeah, that's that's pretty much, yeah, that's what the conclusion we came to yesterday. All right, uh, Jason, good news about our Roku app, right? Yeah, new Roku app is live. Uh, you can actually get that now by entering and exiting the channel store. Otherwise, you will be automatically upgraded sometime within the next 24 hours. So look for it. Good news there. And good news for all of our people at Reddit. You have a subreddit. Yeah, you and you know are about great. this? Technewstoday.reddit.com. Go there. Submit stories, vote things up or down. It helps us choose what stories we talk about each day. Derek Colanduto, thanks so much uh, for hanging out with us today. It's great to have you on the show. Let folks know where they can find the Skepticality podcast and anything else you do online. It's down here in the bottom. I can see it. It's skepticality.com. Uh, you can also get to us from skeptic.com, which is the magazine who sponsors us. So. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, and give us a call. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Ina Fried from All Things D joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.